go. <laughs> Hello, good morning and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. It is fantastic to see so many of you have come out to help us celebrate Henry's big birthday. Henry turned 25 this year. Up, Up and Away is the 25th book containing the 100th Horrid Henry story, if you can believe that. Uh, so I have the great pleasure of welcoming uh, Francesca Simon to the festival today. She's going to tell us a little bit about Henry, answer all of your burning questions, and then we will be signing in the Edinburgh Gin Book Tent just next door at the end of the event. So uh, without further ado, let me welcome Francesca Simon. <laughs> Hello, it is so lovely to be back in Edinburgh. I feel so old hearing about Henry's 25th birthday. I have a feeling this is my 20th. Edinburgh Festival. I think I've been in every single tent. I've kind of made the little tour. The better Henry gets known, sort of the bigger the tent, which is very nice. So thank you all for coming here and keeping me in the lovely big tent. Uh, today, what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, a lot about Horde Henry. I'm going to read you one of the brand new stories, and I will tell you lots of things about how I got various ideas. But first of all, we always need to check how many people in this room think they are a bit like Horrid Henry. Uh-oh. 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 We have extra staff here, just in case. OK, put those horrid hands down. How many people here think they may be a bit like Perfect Peter? <laughs> Good. Good, I'm glad to see some Perfect Peters in the audience, thank goodness. It's hard for me to do an event with all Horrid Henrys. But how many people think that they might be a mixture of Horrid Henry and Perfect Peter? I notice the grown-ups are keeping their hands down. They don't want their children to know the ugly truth. I personally think that everybody in the world is a mixture of Horrid Henry and Perfect Peter. I think if you smashed Horrid Henry and Perfect Peter together, you would get a very ordinary, reasonable child. Because we all, all, all of us, I think, have the desire to be on the beach, build that beautiful sand castle with all the little turrets, and then jump on it and smash it. And it's those two, those two impulses I think that are all about Horrid Henry and Perfect Peter. Because a lot of the time you do want to sit up straight and sit nicely and listen quietly. And then when someone's pigtail is swinging in front of you, it is hard to resist the urge to yank it. Or as a friend of mine did, please do not ever do this. But he got so angry when he was eight years old at the little girl in front of him who used to like to swing her pigtail in his face that one day he got a scissors. <laughs> there are so many things that are too horrid to put in. I just said he got a scissors. Did I say what happened next? I did not. But let's just say he did not return to that school. Um, <laughs> right. Well, as you can hear from my voice, I am not Scottish, much as it would be wonderful to be Scottish. Um, I am American. and. I keep being mistaken for being part of a big, there's so many American tour, tours here. At my hotel, they keep trying to sit me with all, the, with all the American tours, but no, I have lived here a very long time. And I came to the UK, oh gosh, I, oh, we're gonna do dates today, because it's Horrid Henry's 25th birthday. So I came here probably when, you know, in those olden days before cars when there were horses and carriages and we had candles at night, that's about, <laughs> that's about when I came to the United Kingdom and I came to Oxford to study a very useful and interesting and exciting subject which is a guaranteed job at the end and that subject is Anglo-Saxon, <laughs> which is Old English. And you will notice at every job center, there are signs saying, Anglo-Saxonist wanted. Do you know Old English? Please come and apply. There were only seven of us doing this very, very interesting and relevant course. 
for some reason. But the weird and funny thing is, is that you never know what in your life is going to be helpful, interesting, useful to you. And in fact, having studied Anglo-Saxon, I don't think I would have written Horrid Henry if I hadn't studied this, because one of the things you learn about Old English is they love alliteration. Who knows what alliteration is? I bet loads of you do. What is it? Big voice. Two words that start with the same letter. Let's see how well you all alliterate. Horrid, which is H, or perfect, which is P, or moody, which is M. Let's get more difficult. Boudica, battle axe, BB. How about stuck up? S, S, excellent. And we'll do one more. Rude. Yeah. Everyone likes rude, Ralph. All right. Alliteration. And Horrid Henry is filled with alliteration. And I learned all about that doing my incredibly difficult and not always interesting <laughs> Anglo-Saxon course. And then I moved to London. I became a journalist, uh, which meant I wrote for newspapers. And I never had the slightest idea in my head about writing for children till my son Josh was born so long ago that unbelievably we have just celebrated his 30th birthday. But please don't tell anyone that, that he is so old because he is as shocked as I am because there goes my I'm 29. Um, uh, and so um, once, when Josh was born, we started reading a lot of but children's books, I love to read. I've always been a mega big reader. It is the best thing for anyone in this audience who wants to be a writer. And even those of you who don't want to be writers, for me, reading is the best, the most fun thing. Now, any of you who have younger brothers and sisters, I think know that it is not always thrilling entertaining a baby. Sometimes it's quite tricky. So. I started reading to Josh when he was about four months old, basically like, okay, what can we do now, baby? So we would sit on the sofa and we would read loads of books and I started getting a lot of ideas. And my, the first book I ever wrote was called But What Does the Hippopotamus Say? Which I have brought a copy. And um, that was an animal noise book because we were looking at those pictures of cows and horses, and because Josh was so brilliant, even as a baby, I would say, what does the cow say? And he would go, moo. And then I'd say, oh, Josh, you are so smart. What does the horse say? And Josh would go, nay. Oh, I have a genius child here. And then Josh pointed to the caterpillar and looked at me, and I thought, what does the caterpillar say? And that's how I got the idea for my first book, which was all about the animal noises, that animals that you see in these books, like zebras and hippos. I guess, and for those who need to know, what the hippo says is, hun. <laughs> um, so, uh, there I am writing lots of picture books. And um, the idea for Horrid Henry came to me, and I had no thought that this was going to be a book that would be really popular and that everybody would love. No idea whatsoever. Um, but with all books, when you get ideas, I get ideas all the time. Ideas are everywhere. The difference between people who write professionally and those who don't is that everybody gets ideas, and it's what you do with the idea. I mean, everybody. Keep an ideas notebook. Write your ideas down. A really good idea for writing fun, interesting stories is if you look at your ideas notebook and combine two story ideas that don't seem to be connected. So if you were interested, if you have an idea for like a sports story about a sports day and a story about ghosts, what about ghosts having a sports day? It's already more fun. So combine two ideas that don't seem to be connected is always a fun way to start. Um, but um, you know what you bring to a story, for example, 
I love to read, I've told you. I'm the eldest of four children, okay? Now, I longed to be an only child because anybody, how many old eldest children are there in this audience? There are a fair number of eldest children, and those of you who are eldest children will know how unbelievably annoying it is to have younger brothers and sisters who are always pestering you, they want to play with you, they mess up your stuff, and they do boring things. <laughs> but are there any younger children in this audience? There are a fair few of you. <laughs> And younger children, now I cannot speak from experience, but for some reason, my younger brothers and sisters said I was really mean and bossy. <laughs> Would you ever think that I was mean and bossy? And what they say, which I, do, I have to say I don't believe, but younger brothers and sisters say it's awful having older ones who boss them around, who tell them what to do, um, they're so annoying. Anyway, be that as it may, I have my doubts about that. But I think Horrid Henry is written from the perspective probably of an older child. So I couldn't have written it if I wasn't, I think, the eldest. Um, the other thing is I love comic books. I've always loved comic books. And I've actually never met a children's writer who didn't adore comic books. And if you notice some of the words in Horrid Henry, there is a lot of zap, bang, pow kind of stuff, because I, I like that sort of thing. But with Horrid Henry, it all happened very accidentally, which is I was thinking about families where there was a good child and a bad child, and every family divides into that, and the parents know exact, everybody knows exactly who they are in that family. Grown-ups do too. The good, the, you are the good child, of the, and you can change roles. And I happened to have the good fortune of having a niece and nephew who used to fight all the time. I mean, all the time. And, um, but they would swap roles, so uh, my niece started getting A's in school, and my nephew immediately started getting F's. So there was, there was a lot of that kind of back and forth. So I was interested in families where children take on different roles. Um, but I was um, just talking to a friend of mine, and she was an illustrator. And she only drew. You know, you know how all of you in the audience, you know when you're not at school, you're in the meadows making little daisy chains and wearing crowns and doing circle dances, which I think is what everyone does. Those are the kind of children that she used to draw. And um, she said to me on the phone one day, I am just so sick and tired of drawing those lovely dancing children. Couldn't you write a story about somebody horrid? Now the word horrid stuck in my head because uh, as an American I would say horrible so the word horrid, it's like it snagged in my head. And I went, well, yeah, Henry was horrid. Everyone said so. So I thought, maybe there's a little story here about there's someone horrid. But in all stories, it, you need something to fight against. And I thought, OK, if I've got one character who's horrid, we need to have somebody else. Maybe that, that should be a brother, and they should be perfect. So I had horrid Henry and perfect Peter immediately. Um, so I thought, well, maybe there's a little story here. Because Horrid Henry started out as one story. It was never any plan to make it more than one story. Um, but what happened is, when I um, write a story, I write at home in my office, and I work at the top of, of I live in a Victorian terraced house, so I work in the attic, uh, which I hope is a word you all use, attic, yeah. Um, and, um, I uh, work on a computer, and then I print out my work, and then I use a pencil. But I need someone else's help to write my books. Uh, what do I need? Who Do you think it's me who puts the covers on and who sends it? What do I need? I need an illustrator, and I need someone else, something else. I need a, it starts with a P. 
Yes? I need a publisher, and my publisher is Ashet, it was Ryan. Um, so I um, sent my story to them, and they said no. Um, and they said no because they, asked, they had asked me if I would write an early reader, a story for children who were just learning to read. And um, they said it was too difficult, but I had a very brilliant editor, and she said, well, it's not what I asked you for, but I like your story. Let me think if we can make it work. And so then she called me and said, could you write three more stories? Which absolutely panicked me because I had never ever been told to write a story and then written it. And, but I wasn't going to say no. So I said, oh, okay, okay. Which is very funny now that I've written the hundredth Horrid Henry story. But I really thought, well, maybe I just have one. And what I like to do with the stories is um, write is I think about ordinary situations. And then I think, what would Henry do? I ask myself questions. So with the very first Horrid Henry book, um, and I had to write another story, I thought, oh gosh, what am I gonna write? Um, um, well, my son was taking tap dancing lessons, so I thought, well, what would Henry do if he had to take tap dancing lessons? And then I remembered when I was a kid, I used to enjoy making really disgusting <laughs> food. We would go into the fridge and the cupboard and just make something, we called it glop. And just like, could we make it the most horrible looking food possible? So I thought, well, maybe Henry would make glop and, and I hate camping. So I thought, well, what about if Henry also hated camping? So I, I do think about stories like that. And um, that's really how it started. I mean, I think we live at a time when people expect instant success. And the first Horrid Henry book came out called Horrid Henry. And I mean, a few, very tiny number of people had it. Bookshops didn't have it. The only bookshops who carried my books were the independent bookshops, like Autico's. And then teachers slowly started discovering Horrid Henry. And every year my publisher would say, well, should we have another Horrid Henry? And the book that kind of put Horrid Henry on the map, please don't all start scratching, was Horrid Henry's Knits. <laughs> Sorry, I just even sang it, Horrid Henry's Knits. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's think if we can try to imagine how I got the amazing idea for Horrid Henry's Knits. Um, which I do not have now, but um, in America where I grew up, uh, I, knits weren't in schools, I think they are now, but they weren't then, so I didn't know what was wrong with me when I started, you can see that I have a lot of hair, and um, I've, no I've discovered that it's always the nice, friendly children who get knits because they like to lean their heads together as they work. Now, my son was one of those kids who hated working with other children. That was like a nightmare. So um, I think I brought the knits home. I didn't know what it was, so I went to the doctor. And um, she looked at my, she had a medical student in with her, which was fine. And I said, you know, my head, it's terrible. And she said, um, I'm really sorry, you have nits? And the medical student who's there to learn how to be a nice, kind, caring doctor went like this. <laughs> Which made me feel really great. Because um, I, I didn't know what this was. And she, my doctor pointed to her head and said, do you notice that I um, basically have shaved my head? And I said, yes. Yeah. She said, that's the only way I could get rid of the, my nits. I thought, wow. Um, and I subsequently discovered that like everybody had knits. And a friend of mine had to testify in front of parliament. She had four children. And she said, all I could think about was would people see all the knits in my hair? I thought, wow, I've got to write about knits. So let me take you through a few of the older Horrid Henry books before I read you a story from the new book, which is Up, Up, and Away. So. At the top, we have Horrid Henry, the first story. So, knits, knits, knits. I've already told you that sad story of how I got the idea. Um, tricking the Tooth Fairy. Um, my son is an August child, 
which means he was always the youngest in his class. And he came home one day crying because he said, everybody has lost a tooth but me. I thought, oh dear, poor Josh. But then I thought as a mean mother, ah, what would Henry do <laughs> if he was the only child who hadn't lost a tooth? Um, I don't always get ideas from what happens in real life, but I often do. Um, one of my favorite stories is Horrid Henry, Get Rich Quick. And that was because um, my son was interested in having a jumble sale. And I said he could have one. And then I thought, of course, oh, Horrid Henry, what would he have in his jumble sale? And I thought, well, he'd have Peter. <laughs> he would sell Peter as jumble. And so he sells Peter to Moody Margaret which I just find really funny. And Peter is very happy to be sold because he gets 10p. <laughs> and then he asks why he costs two pounds and gets 10p. <laughs> and Henry says, shopkeeper's expenses. Um, so that story makes me laugh a lot. Uh, it probably is my favorite story just because it's so ridiculous, I guess. And oh gosh, Horrid Henry and the Haunted House. <gasps> well, first of all, how many of you have read The Haunted House? Well, that's a really sort of scary story. You know, Horrid Henry has a terrible cousin named Stuck Up Steve. And Henry goes and has to spend the weekend, and Stuck Up Steve tries to scare him. So Henry takes revenge. Do you remember what he does? He hides under Henry's bed, uh, uh, hides under Steve's bed yeah. and pokes it. <laughs> and I got this idea because a friend of mine is w the youngest of 10 children. And she told me once, because I try to collect, I asked my friends, what's the most horrid thing that happened to you when you were a kid? Which is why I learned about my friend and the ponytail and the scissors. Um, and she said, for two weeks, two whole weeks, two of her older brothers hid under her bed <laughs> and poked the mattress. So she started thinking there were monsters under the bed, and there really were monsters under the bed. So I thought, that is such a great Horrid Henry trick. We've got to do that. Um, the mummy's curse is an idea that I actually got here in Edinburgh, and it's the only idea I have ever got actually talking to a group. And I was doing one of the school's outreach programs, and I was talking to the school, and um, I happened to mention that I am a nervous person and I hate horror films. So it came time for questions, and every kid who put up their hand, because nobody was listening to anybody else, so I was getting a bit angry. And uh, the first kid said, do you like horror films? I said, no, I really don't like them. And the second kid, paying no attention, said, do you like horror films? No. The third kid, do you like horror films? At which point I really, it's the only time actually I've lost my temper with the crowd. I said, for the last time, I don't like horror films. What, I don't know what you want, like Horrid Henry and the Mummy's Curse? I thought, ooh, <laughs> good idea for a story because I am American. What do American children call their mothers? Mom, M-O-M, -M, or mommy. Now, when I was seven years old, I lived in London for a year. And I discovered something really surprising and strange, which is that British children call their mothers mummy. And to me, that is like calling your mother vampire, <laughs> or werewolf, or creature from the Black Lagoon, mummy? So I thought it has to be a joke about Henry's mother being a mummy, and everyone always likes it when Henry tries to trick Peter. So I thought, okay, he's gonna trick Peter into thinking his mother is a mummy. And um, it was a really hard story. I couldn't work out what, how the trick would work. And it was really scary, because when you write a book, you publish the title, 
way before, I used to always be asked what the title of the next Horrid Henry was before I'd written a word, because my brilliant illustrator, Tony Ross, would need he would be drawing the covers not knowing what the story was so that they could six months or eight months in advance put out a picture of the cover and say this is the next story. So I had a really specific title, Horrid Henry and the Mummy's Curse and not much of a story. We got down to the wire on that one and that's why all the subsequent books have had much easier names like Horrid Henry's Revenge or <laughs> something that was a bit more generic, yeah. Um, so one or two other stories I will tell you about. Horrid Henry in the Comfy Black Chair. How many of you like that story? About them fighting over the TV remote. That's based on my niece and nephew because my brother, for reasons best known to himself, had a rule in his house. They had a comfy black chair and the rule was in his family, whoever sat on the comfy black chair controlled the TV remote. I was not there to intervene because what a stupid rule. And what happened, of course, his children spent their lives pushing each other off this chair. Um, and in fact, they broke the chair finally. So they were always saying, you know, David, mom wants you. And little David would get off the chair and then his sister would jump on it. And then he said, sorry, I've got the chair. So yeah, perfect, perfect Horrid Henry material. So that was always a good one. Um, but today I am going to read you a story from the brand new 25th Horrid Henry story, which is Horrid Henry Up, Up, and Away. And the four stories in this are Horrid, 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 Horrid Henry Up, Up, and Away, which is Horrid Henry's first airplane ride, where he's been told by Stuck Up Steve, Stuck Up Steve has described the most luxurious first class experience <laughs> imaginable, which Henry thinks he is going to be having until he gets on the plane. Horrid Henry changes history, where Horrid Henry has to write an essay about the Tudors, knowing nothing about the Tudors. Um, Horrid Henry Steals the Show is a story I've always wanted to write about a school play and Henry ha doing all the sound effects. And then finally, Horrid Henry and the Zoom of Doom. How many people in this room like roller coasters? Bleh. A lot of you. I am terrified of roller coasters, but I do like water slides. And I was at a lit festival, literary festival in Dubai, and they have a very famous water slide park and some really scary high up rides that there was no way I was going to go on. And what happened was this, I went with a friend of mine who's a war correspondent of all things, we went on this fairly scary ride, we thought, and everybody, when we came back, we told them we'd been on this ride and they went, oh wow, I'm much too scared to go on that. So we felt really great. So when we went back, we thought, why don't we do it again? And as we got on the uh, ride, um, we were saying to each other, um, do you remember being this high up? My friend was saying, no, but maybe our memory's right. And then I said, do you remember like wearing seat belts? And she said, no, but maybe they've changed the ride. And at this point we realized a terrible thing, which was that we had not been on the scary ride at all, but we were sure on it now. And as we went over the edge and plunged down to the bottom, I just thought, I'm not gonna live. I'm not gonna live, but if I do. Anyway, that is the, <laughs> the basis of Horrid Henry and the Zoom of Doom, which sadly was based on something that actually happened to me. So this is Horrid Henry going on a school trip with his class. Everyone ready to listen to a story? Okie dokie, sit back, relax, and hopefully enjoy. And just think about me on that ride at the appropriate moment. 
Okay. Bob, 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 Bob. The giant teacups bobbed down the lazy river. Whee! squealed perfect Peter. Whee! squealed tidy Ted. Whee! squealed perky Parveen. Whee! squealed all the mini ninnies seated in the giant floating teacups. Terrified screams rang out from a nearby ride. Moody Margaret and Sour Susan and Brainy Brian and Jazzy Jim were whizzing down belly flop drop in a bouncing rubber raft, which twisted and looped and spun backwards. Duck, hissed Henry. Don't let them see us. Horrid Henry and Rude Ralph slunk down in their little seats as low as they could go. If Margaret or any of their classmates saw them riding in the toddler teacups, their names would be mud forever. Sit up, Henry, said Miss Battleaxe. You too, Ralph, Horrid Henry groaned. How had he, Horrid Henry, ended up trapped in a giant teacup with Miss Battleaxe and his wormy worm brother and the rest of Miss Lovely's infant class at Wild Waterslide Park? He wanted to go racing down the Zoom of Doom, the twisting, looping roller coaster water slide with the world's steepest drop, where cannonballs blasted you as you hurtled backwards through waterfalls, flipping you upside down and spinning you as you crashed, screaming into Crocodile Creek. Or belly flop drop with its jet sprays and stomach churning twists or crash splash, where rubber rings race towards each other before veering off into tunnels of terror. The shame, the misery, the horror of being trapped in giant teacups instead. With, oh, whoa, only more baby rides to come. It was so unfair. Was it his fault he disappeared with Rude Ralph on the last class trip? The class had got lost, not them. Or that he jumped from the little white train chugging around the World War II, Second World War airfield on the school trip before that because he'd seen a plane he needed to investigate? That certainly wasn't his fault. It was the schools for not showing them anything interesting. Gondola ride on the baby bayou next, everyone, smiled Miss Lovely. Yay, trilled the infants. The gondolas are so exciting, said Goody Goody Gordon. I don't want to go on the stupid gondola ride, yelled Horrid Henry. I want to go on the Zoom of Doom. That's much too scary, said Perfect Peter. It's a straight drop to the bottom, gasped Tidy Ted. I'm scared of heights, whimpered Perky Parveen. I am with them. Don't worry, we won't be going anywhere near the Zoom of Doom, said Miss Lovely. I want to go on the Zoom of Doom, howled Horrid Henry. Henry, Ralph, you're staying with me, said Miss Battleaxe, and that's final. There will be no repeat of last year or the year before that. And as I do not like water slides, we will be sticking with Miss Lovely's class. Can we be Henry and Howell a huge no? <laughs> uh, excuse me, I didn't say can we be Peter. Can we be Henry, please, and Howell a big no? <laughs> no! We want to interrupt every other event <laughs> on this site. Yes, snapped Miss Battleaxe. She shuddered. Ugh. She would rather swim with sharks than go on a water slide and be hurled backwards into an abyss. The very thought made her feel faint. Once when she was a little girl, she tried a teeny weeny roller coaster and spent a week recovering from the fright in a darkened room. No water slides for her. Horrid Henry scowled. He had to escape from his battle axe and get on the Zoom. He had to. He loved scary rides and big drops and roller coasters more than anything in the whole wide world. And oh, the agony, here he was, finally at Wild Water Slide Park, and he was trapped with the infants. He whispered to rude Ralph. Ralph smiled. 
Good plan, he said. Just as their giant teacup reached the dock, Root Ralph stood up, wobbled, and toppled over the side into the river. He started splashing and shrieking. Man overboard, shouted Horrid Henry. Help! Help! He'd escape in all the commotion and get straight on the Zoom before anyone could stop him. Henry leaped off the teacup. A hideous hand grabbed his shoulder. Not so fast, said Miss Battleaxe. Weren't you rescuing Ralph, screamed Henry. He's drowning. <laughs> Help, yelped Ralph, spluttering and flailing. Help! Stand up, Ralph, said Miss Battleaxe. Slowly, rude Ralph stood up in the shallow water, which only reached his knees. Rats. Everyone get in line and follow me to the baby by you, trilled Miss Lovely. Yay, said Perfect Peter. The baby by you is my favorite ride. Horrid Henry pinched Peter. Perfect Peter screamed. Henry pinched me, he wailed. I was just checking to see if you were an alien, hissed Henry, and you are. Moody Margaret and Sour Susan strolled past, laughing. Oh, wow, that was so much fun, squealed Moody Margaret. Yeah, squealed Sour Susan. Let's go on the Zoom of Doom now, said Margaret loudly, and then belly flop drop. Did you enjoy the giant teacups, Henry? I hope you weren't too scared, said Moody Margaret, smirking. Horrid Henry gritted his teeth. What could he say or do other than hope that a giant sea monster would rise up from the lazy river and swallow Margaret whole? Too bad you won't get to ride the Zoom of Doom, Henry, said Margaret. No, 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 jeered Margaret and Susan, racing off to join the long queue, snaking away from the entrance to the Zoom of Doom. We've got to escape, muttered Horrid Henry. Too right, said Rude Ralph. Henry looked at Ralph. Ralph looked at Henry. Run, shouted Horrid Henry. Henry and Ralph ran off as fast as they could. They darted through the crowds, pushing and shoving and leaping, closer and closer and closer to the Zoom of Doom. Crash, bang. And where do you think you're going, came a terrible voice. Huh? There was Miss Battleaxe standing in front of them, arms crossed. They'd slammed right into her. We needed the loo, said Henry. It was an emergency, said Rude Ralph. Miss Battleaxe glared at them. Poor Miss Battleaxe, really. If you so much as move an inch from my side again, you'll be taken straight to the bad children's room to wait for your parents to collect you, said Miss Battleaxe. Yikes, the bad children's room. If Henry got sent home, he'd have no chance of ever getting on the Zoom of Doom. His parents would never take him back to Wild Water Slide Park, that was for sure. He'd have to grit his teeth and find another way. Horrid Henry and Rude Ralph followed the infants to the gondolas on the baby by you. I feel seasick, said Rude Ralph suddenly. Those teacups made me dizzy. I need to go to the first aid room. He winked at Henry. Oh, yeah, me too, said Horrid Henry. He clutched his stomach. Ah, you can just leave us to recover there. We don't want to stop anyone having fun. Miss Battleaxe took Horrid Henry and Rude Ralph, groaning and moaning, to the first aid room. They lay down on two cots. No need to stay with, with us, groaned Henry. We'll just lie here uh, till it's home time, moaned Ralph. These boys are suffering from seasickness, said Miss Battleaxe to the nurse. Tummy ache, said the nurse. Yes, moaned Henry. Dizzy? Oh, oh, yes, said Ralph. Feeling like you're going to vomit? Any second, said Henry. 
Not to worry, said the nurse. I have just the right injection. <laughs> she advanced towards them, waving two enormous needles. You know, I feel a lot better, said Henry. <laughs> Me too, said Ralph. Excellent, said Miss Battleax. Now off we go to the dozy dinghies. If we're lucky, we'll catch Miss Lovely at the steamboats for a relaxing journey round the Pixie Pond. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed making up those names. How was it possible, thought Henry miserably trudging after her, to have so many baby rides in a water slide park? Good question. He could see tough Toby and fierce and fiery Fiona whizzing down panic precipice, whooping and laughing while he was trapped on the pixie pond. Last ride before home time, said Miss Lovely, Lullaby Lagoon or the fairy float boats. <laughs> Lullaby Lagoon might be too scary, said Spotless Sam. How about the cannibal canoes where you get eaten as you ride, snarled Horrid Henry. That's why all the canoes come back empty. <laughs> Quiet, Henry, said Miss Battleax. Soon she'd be safely home with her feet up and the school outing would be over for another year. Fairy floats, fairy floats, chanted the infants. Where are the fairy float boats, said Miss Lovely. Right next to the Zoom of Doom, said Miss Battleaxe, pointing to the huge queues jostling each other, waiting for both rides. Just to torture him, thought Horrid Henry, as he plodded over to the queue for the fairy float boats. Could his day have got even worse? So near, and yet so far. There were so many people pushing and shoving that the queues were starting to mix. You couldn't tell which queue was which. <gasps> and then Horrid Henry had a brilliant, spectacular idea. It was perilous. It was dangerous. The chance of success was tiny. And yet, how could he not risk his life for a chance to ride the... Come on, everyone, this way, this way, said Henry, weaving through the queues. Perfect Peter, Goody Goody Gordon, and Tidy Ted followed him. Slowly, Henry inched his way to the right into the Zoom of Doom queue. Follow me, shouted Rude Ralph, ushering Miss Battleax, Miss Lovely, and her class to the right behind Henry. Finally, they reached the head of the queue. What's this ride again, asked Perky Parveen. Fairy float boat, said Henry, grabbing a seat at the front of the black skull raft. <laughs> oh, I love the fairy float boat, said Perfect Peter. Miss Lovely and Miss Battleax sat down. I don't remember seat belts on the fairy float boats, said Miss Battleax, buckling up. Do you, Lydia? No, said Miss Lovely. Must be new health and safety rules. Seat belts on, everyone. The rubber rafts began a slow ascent up the track. Lydia, said Miss Battleax, I don't remember riding in black skulls on the ferry float boats, do you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Must be a new design, said Miss Lovely. The rafts climbed higher. Soft music began to play. Boudica, said Miss Lovely, don't we seem rather high up for the fairy float boats? <laughs> now that you mention it, said Miss Battleax, she peered over the edge. Lydia, I've got the feeling we're not but before she could finish speaking, the raft plunged over the edge, spun backwards, and plummeted straight down. Miss Battleax screamed. <laughs> Miss Lovely screamed. <laughs> the infant screamed. Henry and Ralph, they'd done it. 
they were riding on the zoom of doom at last. Life was sweet. <laughs> and now we've got loads of time for your fantastic questions because I'm thinking in my head of all the things I meant to tell you and I didn't tell you. So I'm hoping you will ask these questions. We have four mics, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and speak when you have a microphone. Can we have our first question, please? Go ahead. Where did you first um, think of Horrid Henry? In what location? I was actually in my sitting room. That's, I've never been asked that question. Thank you. Um, I was in my sitting room on my phone, standing, looking out the window, the bay window. I was, that's exactly where I was, where I got the idea. Next question. Go ahead. What's your favorite Horace Henry character? Ooh, my favorite character. Um, I... I kind of like, I like Beefy Bert. I mean, I love Henry and Peter, obviously, but I like Beefy Bert because he never says anything but, I don't know. <laughs> um, which I discovered by accident was what my brothers always say, because both my brothers hate making any kind of decision. And I discovered this when I was on holiday with one of my brothers, who at the time, I have to say, was in charge of a huge company and had about a thousand employees. <laughs> And I would say, Roth, shall we take the kids to the beach? And he would go, I don't know. And I'd say, well, where do you want to go out for dinner? I don't know. <laughs> I thought, you are beefy Bert. And I had no idea. But yeah, I'm very fond of thinking of silly situations where Bert can say, like, you know, you know, how, do you have a dog? I don't know. <laughs> what do you want for Christmas? I don't know. So just really silly questions. So yeah, I'm fond of beefy Bert. Next question. Yes, go ahead. Um, how long did uh, the book take? Um, it usually takes me about four months to write a Horrid Henry story. What takes me a really long time is thinking of the ideas and thinking up funny twists. I write pretty fast, but then I write and I rewrite and I change it, and then I read it out loud. And usually in a book of four stories, three stories work really well, and the fourth story everyone goes, oh. Is that the end? Or, oh, why? Uh, so I know that there's something wrong there. But about four months. Next question. Yes, go ahead. When did you create Horrid Henry? When did I create Horrid Henry? Um, I created it, the first book was published in, if, if this is the 25th anniversary of Horrid Henry, I think it was 1994 was the very first Horrid Henry, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> yes, next question, please, go ahead. What is your favorite Horrid Henry story? Well, I really love, as I said, Horrid Henry gets rich quick, but I'm really fickle. You know how your parents always like their newest child first? <laughs> um, I always like my, my newest book the most. That's not true, actually. <laughs> But um, yes, um, so probably I like Horrid Henry's injection because I am, I used to be very frightened of injections. So I wrote that story because it scared me because, you know, my son was like, he just put his hand out, big deal. And I would be like, no! So I thought I'll make Horrid Henry, that'll be the only thing he's scared of is injections. Next question, yes, go ahead. How many Horrid Henry names have you thought of? Oh, I hate those questions. You know, I don't know. It must be over 60. There are so many, and the way I get the names is I think of terrible adjectives, like rude or horrid or moody or sour, and then I put the name, uh, is how I get all the names. Uh, next question. Yes, go ahead. Has Beefy Bert ever said anything else apart from, I don't know? He has never said anything other than, I don't know, no matter what the question, if they said, what's your name? He'd go, I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, he never says anything, but I don't know. Are you making a new Horrid Henry book? 
Um, not at the moment. I think 25 books and 100 stories is a pretty nice amount of Horrid Henry books. And I'm also writing some books for older children. Um, I love Norse mythology. So I wrote a book called The Monstrous Child about hell, the Norse goddess of the dead. And I turned that into an opera, which was done at the Royal Opera House this year, which was really fun. So I'm enjoying writing for slightly older children. I'm really enjoying doing more operas. I might do another horror time. Listen, never say never. Sean Connery came back to 007. I might be tempted. But there is something lovely about 25 books, 100 stories. Next question. What age is Moody Margaret? What is Moody Margaret? What age? Ah, Moody Margaret. Well, I never say how old they are, but I always think, shh, that, hor that the Ohrid Henry and Moody Margaret are about eight, and Perfect Peter is about five or six. But I never, ever say. And incidentally, Moody Margaret started life as a boy because I have a son, and I couldn't make the character work. And my husband, whose name happens to be Martin, wasn't very happy about being Moody Martin. <laughs> and he saw his chance and leapt in and suggested I turn Moody Martin into a boy, Moody Margaret. And I thought, yes, a combination of me as a child and Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and that was, that's her character, yeah. Next question, go ahead. Was was Miss Battleax the same as your teacher? Was Miss Battleaxe, thank you, that's an excellent question. Luckily, I never had a teacher like Miss Battleaxe, but I love her name. It's my favorite Horrid Henry name, Boudica Battleaxe, because I just think that's, um, that's a really funny name. My son was doing the Romans at the time, but Tony Ross told me he had a really mean granny, and he he uh, drew Miss Badlax to look like his mean granny. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Who's your favorite boy character in the Harvard Henry? Who's my favorite boy character? Um, well, I feel so sorry for Peter because nobody likes him. Because I thought all the parents would love perfect Peter and they frankly can't stand him. <laughs> And I think it's because of the horrid Henry in them, because Perfect Peter's not so perfect, but it's funny that parents don't like Perfect Peter, um, because in a way, he does everything that they, parents are always saying to their kids, you know, sit up straight, eat your dinner, stop slouching, elbows off the table, don't be mean to your brother. And Perfect Peter doesn't do any of those things, but they still don't like him. So I don't know what the lesson, you can draw the lesson. I will not be drawing it for you. Yes, go ahead. Would you like there to be a Horrid Henry movie? No, because I really don't like the Horrid Henry movie. I had nothing to do with it, and I don't think it bears any resemblance to Horrid Henry. So I'm all about the books. Go ahead. Were the skulls flat and made out of foam? Well, luckily it's a story, so I didn't really think about it. I imagined it was a boat, sort of shaped like a skull, like with a skull in the front. I just made that up because I thought the idea of having a black skull for a fairy float boat was so funny. <laughs> uh, next question, yes, go ahead. If you don't like the movie, do you like the programs? No, I'm sorry for those of you who like the programs. No, I don't, again, because I don't think they're anything like Horrid Henry, and they could be called something completely different. So yeah, that is a great sadness to me, that they're not better. But what can you do? <laughs> uh, next question, yes, go ahead. Do you have any friends that write books? Uh, I thought you were going to ask me if I had any friends, and I thought, oh no, I'm back in primary school. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of friends who write books because, um, you know, we meet each other here at festivals. I've made a lot of friends here at the festival. Um, so yes, a, about half of my good friends are also writers. That is true. And medievalists. <laughs> 
Uh, next question, yes. Why is Henry so horrid? <laughs> no, it's a really good question. Why is Henry so horrid? The reason is, is that when you think about it, in a story, one of the things that, reasons that we love to read and to watch things on television and to go to movies is we want to explore lives that are different from ours. And if my books were called Perfect Peter, it would be like everyone's life. You come home, you do your homework, you drink a glass of milk, you set the table, you know, you know this. And the idea of, of books, if someone's horrid, they're doing things that would be kind of thrilling to do. So you get all the thrill of doing something outside of your own life and none of the consequences. Like how perfect is that? That's why books are so exciting. So you get all the fun of being terrible and you're never punished, <laughs> which is just heaven. But it is fun in books to explore what would it be like if? What would it be like to do? So that's why he's horrid. It's also more fun. Because a lot about books is that you want people to be surprised. You don't want to, if I wrote a story called Perfect Peter, you would know what that story was. And the only two stories that are about Perfect Peter is when he acts out of character. Because otherwise there is no story. Yes, go ahead. Did you want to be an author when you were younger? I actually wanted to be president. <laughs> I did. Um, I was always interested in writing, and I used to write fairy, I started writing when I was about eight years old, and I wrote fairy tales and things like that, which I have to say I never finished. So finish your stories, that's very important, all of you who want to be writers, really important. Um, I kind of did, but not seriously. Um, I've always loved writing, so I was, but it, just because you, are a writer doesn't mean you can write everything. And I had no idea that what I was going to be really good at was writing stories for children. I didn't know this. And I'm sure if I had never had Josh, I would never have become a children's author. Because I just didn't, it just wasn't in my head that I would do this. Yes, go ahead. Um, what is the favorite book that you've read? My favorite book that I read when I was your age was um, books, uh, a book called by Edward Eager called Half Magic, um, which, because I love books about magic happening to us. I have no interest in magic happening in a galaxy far, far away. I don't care about that. I want magic to happen to me now. But one of my best books I've ever read now um, is a book called Holes by Lewis Sacker, which is an incredible book. Um, Two Weeks with the Queen. Um, is an extraordinary book by Morris Gleitzberg. I mean, those are two absolute standout, brilliant books. Uh, anything by Frank Cottrell Boyce, Millions, um, is an extraordinary book too. Yes. How many countries did you sell the books in? Um, Hort Henry's published in over 30 countries. So yeah, a lot of them. And it's really fun. It's translated into Welsh and Irish. Icelandic, Faroese. Uh, next, yes, go ahead. How many books did you write? I've lost count. I've written between, I think I've written about 60 now. I should really count them up, shouldn't I? I get asked this and I've just forgot. I, you know, you get beyond a certain number and you kind of forget. I imagine if your parents had 52 children, they might <laughs> forget a few of their names. Maybe they would lose them in a park somewhere. You know, it's harder to keep track. I think a couple more questions, and I think we have to stop. Yes? How did you think of Horrid Henry's parents? Well, Horrid Henry's parents, have, you, you may have noticed, have no names, and they have no existence beyond being Horrid Henry's parents. And the whole thing about parents is you want them out of the way. So it's a little bit harder in a book set like in our world. So the parents are kind of there just to go, don't be Horrid Henry. Um, so I was thinking about me, like me in my worst parent mode, me in my like, stop it, oh, I'm so tired, leave me alone. That, so I made all the bad things of me into the parents, because the parents are well-meaning, they're just not very effective. Um, the one thing that's not me is because I only have one child. The thing is that Horrid Henry's parents favor Peter. They have created the situation. 
because they're always saying things like, you know, why can't you be good like Peter? And that is one thing that never makes anyone want to be good like their sibling. When you were little, who was your favorite children's author? Edward Eager and Louisa May Alcott. But Edward Eager is published by Oxford University Press. You can still get his books. They are absolutely incredible. I love them. I've read each one about nine times. I used to do nothing but read when I was a kid. I would read for about six hours a day. Um, that is all I did. Yes. Uh, final, I think we better take the last two questions. And listen, if you haven't, if you, I haven't answered your question, come and see me in the book signing tent and ask me your question then. Because I will stay and sign all books and answer all questions. Do not worry. Yes. What's the scariest roller coaster you've been on? <gasps> I have never been on a, oh yes, I've been on the Matterhorn at Disneyland. That's the one and only roller coaster I've ever been on. I hate roller coasters. But weirdly enough, my nephew, who is only nine years old, loves roller coasters. The scarier, the better. And he's little. And he goes around America with my brother, the one who was the inspiration for Beefy Bert. And they go on anything terrifying. They're members of the Roller Coaster Club of America, and they go on the worst horrible ones. That water slide one that I went on in Dubai was so frightening to me, and it was so, um, yeah, I love that my friend who spends her life in war zones was t as frightened as me. We were both just beside ourselves. <laughs> but it is a good story. And final question. With Last question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, what, what was I going to ask? Um, <laughs> what if, um, how fast was the roller coaster that Henry went on in the book? It was so fast that lightning couldn't touch it. <laughs> Listen, you have been, as always in Edinburgh, the most superb audience. Thank you so much for coming.